Fox lines and connect them up there instead of bringing them all the way back. And it, I don't know if here, but I know in, in Norfolk, if you see a box on a pole about this big, about this big, about this big, about halfway up a pole, and you look at it, you'll see a little wire coming, black wire coming into it, that's a fiber optic line. If you see a big wire coming out of it, that's coaxial lines. And you'll see a little wire going up to the power line, because that's how it gets powered. Those are nodes that allow the table companies to increase their capacity without having to change out the wire going to your home. That will run out of gas. They're dependent very heavily on very low usage. Uh, and in order to improve it, they've got to shrink the ties of the lines and they have to put in new amplifiers, which is expensive. In San Francisco, uh, I live half a year in San Francisco. Uh, I got new service there last year. The minimum they would give me was 400 megabits. Minimum. I pay 50 bucks a month for it. Uh, the reason is that in San Francisco, because it's a huge market, they have re-engineered their line, and the maximum capacity, the maximum frequency is 1.2 gigahertz, which means that they basically double the bandwidth. Here, your lines probably stop at 600 gigahertz, and they're not going to fix it. It's just no, no percentage of them do. So as, as speeds go up, the places that are urban are going to be able to track. They won't. They won't hear. They just won't. We we have we have a networks here that are even inferior to the ones that are in Hartford because you've got to go in and change all the amplifiers. You've got to replace these boxes. It's expensive to do. Um, but there is a little fiber in there. What you have coming to the house, however, is coax. So the question I get a lot is about the CEN network and what the function, what? the C CEN? CEN network. Yeah, what the function is of CEN, what's the function of existing fiber on the poles, and is it a, is this strategy a replacement to that no. or a partnership with that? Partnership. CEN stands for Connecticut Education Network. It connects schools and libraries to central resource facilities. It was put in about, what? five years, six years ago, seven years ago, something like that. There is another network called the Public Safety Data Network. Uh, it's exactly the same thing, except it connects police stations and fire stations to 911 services and other things. Together, they're called the Nutmeg Network. It was financed by the state, um, partly by the state. It all runs over fiber optic lines that are owned by Crown Castle. They lease them from Crown Castle. There's a lot of capacity in those lines. Fiber is almost infinite, almost infinite, not quite. But they don't. The limits on fiber are the transceivers, not the not not the wire. Um, they've got Ericsson. Ericsson. Uh, this last two weeks ago said they've got some transceivers now that will go 80 terabits per second over over fiber. Now you don't want to think about what the cost of those transceivers, but um, the, the, it's it's infinite. Best you're going to ever get out of a copper line that's long enough to be sensible is probably about five megabits, gigabits per second. Um, so, what CEN has though is a, is a lot of capacity. They can multiplex other signals onto that line. They also have little switches in schools and, and libraries. Now, they're not proposing that we use those switches because it's not reliable. But the network will actually look like wire from to a switch all going to a hub, and that switch will be a CEN switch. That will be connected through the CEN network up to the internet and other services, but principally up to the internet. And they will be the ISP. So they'll take care of security, they take care of email, they take care of everything else. It's a nice partnership with the state. Uh, they're very good. I know the CEN director pretty well, and we work well with them. So. Nice, nice idea. You've been working on this, excuse me, Martha, for how long now? Well, <laughs> do you want me to be embarrassed and tell you the real story? <laughs> or what, any way you want. Well, I published a paper in Norfolk in 20, 2012 that suggested we do this. Um, it was with a bunch of other stuff. And, uh, so I've been pushing for this. It's, it's just kind of the, the rule of thumb, if you look places that have had to have some community support for this is it takes two years from the time the, the leaders of the community decide to do it. And, and we're probably now in the 
for the second year of that process, I would say. It's been an extended version. Now, part of it was because in 2015, I went into Northwest Connect where we were looking at a regional solution rather than just a Norfolk solution. So we sort of dropped a market from the picture. And we talked, to North, we talked to Frontier for a year, and then we did some other things. We got some money from the state to do outreach. Um, we got our act together in terms of costs, in terms of partnerships. Um, but then we got hammered in, in May of 2018. Pura said, you can't get to the polls. And I didn't want to complicate this any more than I have to, but we only get to the polls now by creating an electric utility. That complicates life a little bit. There's actually some very good things about that. But um, if you have an electric utility in this state, you can get to the polls. If you aren't, you can't get to the polls. That may change in the next legislative cycle. Sure. But until that happens, we have to pursue it. Yeah. So that, that raises, in my mind, a deregulation kind of question. One of my pet peeves has been, if I live in Litchfield, I have to use Optimum. Right. I can't use Charter, or I can't use yes. Infinity, or whatever the other competitors are. Wouldn't it be more competitive if, I mean, can they all use the same lines now? And, and could this all, a number of offerers use the same lines to make it competitive? The, the, History of cable companies. They they um, were franchised, regula regulated as franchises for a very long time, which means there was no legal way to like cable keeping companies could be in their own territory, and that was to protect them in some respects because they had a lot of money invested in, in, in cable lines. Uh, that that disappeared about ten or fifteen years ago, and it would be it's legal now for a charter or cable vision to go into the same territories as Comcast and the others. The trouble is that you've got to spend a lot of money for the cable. They can't use Comcast's cable. They've got to put their own cable in. And either there's been a gentleman's agreement among the cable companies, or the, the finances just bar trying to compete with exactly the same product. I mean, what are they going to offer? They can't offer cheaper television service because the television business, business is driven by content. And content goes up 10% a year. Sports salaries, CGI, after salaries. For this network, is the vision that we would collectively, as a, as a like, Alicia County region or as a town region, we would open for bid like different providers to, supply, to support this town we could for do that. five years or 10 years? We could or do that. Years? We could do that. Um, at least towns have done that as so-called open access. Um, and I think the other part is, can we have two carriers could. support could. the region? Could. But, but you've got to ask who paid for the wire. Well, assuming assuming that it is um, subsidized by the community, as a tax or whatever. You don't want to plan for the state? What's that? You want, you want to plan for the state? No, you, you don't want to plan for the state for anything. They don't have any money. No, this is good. This is good. <laughs> I gave, this, I gave this paper to Lamont. If you want to see this paper, I've got a 20 page paper on this subject. I'm happy to give it to anybody. If the state were to, the 21,000 miles of road in the state, 900,000 telephone poles, if the state were to put fiber optic wiring on all 21,000 miles, it would cost about $1.2 billion. That sounds like a terrifying number. But they can get 40 year terms. Divide that by 1.5 million homes. Divide that by 40. Multiply it by 0.04 to run the numbers, and you will find that, and then you add the poll, you have to pay for being on the polls. So they had to do that. You get to a figure that's slightly over $4 a month per home to do that. That can be built into uh, subscriptions. Now, if I'm wrong, and maybe it's higher than that, significantly, the state may have to pay something. But it's this cost of a movie ticket, half the cost of a movie ticket, a quarter of the cost of a movie ticket. You know, it costs hundred dollars a month per home and can in here to do to do work meetings. We're at five hundred dollars a home as a state to pay for education. A sewer line costs one point two million dollars in this down mile if it goes down twelve feet. A good road costs that kind of money. 
This is nothing. So if the state did, Vermont could stand up in March of next year, June of next year, and say, we're going to be the first gigabit state in the country because nobody's thinking this way. Then what you do is you offer for, to, you go to Comcast, Century, they, Verizon, AT&T, Frontier, maybe they're still alive, and say, you can compete with each other for that little piece of land to the home. And they would have to compete for the first time in history for something that really would make some sense. Ten years from now, the entire state would be ready for it. And it would be a completely competitive market. Completely competitive market. It would be that. And it would be treated exactly like Richard Rose's service systems. Private carriers, private people do plumbing into a plumbing, right? We don't even know plumbing. Yeah, the bill drafted. Um, <laughs> I haven't done that. I haven't done that far. I don't have that much hits for. I mean, I have some. But not that much. The other thing that opens the doors for private sector investment. So, for example, in Vermont, um, the Center for Center for Rural Innovation. Yeah. The, so. Uh, Matt Dunn's group. Matt Dunn, yeah. Um, they are. It's in the middle of Vermont. Not really. Just colder than here, but not much different other than that. And uh, Google's put in significant dollars towards economic development. But the criteria that they were that has to be fiber optic. So you have to have fiber optic. So we look at that, we're not we're not eligible. And so um, this opens you know, this opens the door for economic development grants, but from the private sector. There are twenty one towns in the mountains of Vermont that are big fiber optics. Yeah. Some of them are already finished. And it's 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 partly private money, partly mm -hmm. Public that, that program, they've been able to activate some like bizarre, like I, I think one of their partners is in like Idaho or something. Like they completely off the off the beaten path, but they're creating these little. Yeah. They're doing a nice thing. That the model, the business model, the development model is to train people there to live there, uh, because Google and everybody else in Silicon Valley is running out of people. They're putting buildings elsewhere. To get Basically, there aren't enough people there to do the work they need. Well, they so if you train them, they can become remote workers. But you have to have very high speed access in both directions in order for that. That becomes available to anybody here. It's not, the, 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 so it's not a downside, but it's not a growth strategy. It's, it's having the resources you have getting better. It's not a strategy that says we will bring people. Ben and I and others have felt that the sex of people alone was saying we are a gigabit state, we are a gigabit town. If you buy any town, any house in these towns, you have a gigabit going in both directions. You will never worry about how much data you need, ever. What ever. happens if, if a pole goes down? I mean, if you have fiber optics, but you said this probably has to be on poles, not on the ground. Who, the, who do you call to say, please fix well, this? Well, a service provision. They're, they're, there has to be somebody with trucks and <coughs> that's all built into the fee. But the contract, yeah. the, the subcontracting of the service, um, part of that contract is actually the maintenance of the existing lines. So our, our we, we would be more or less fronting the capital expenditure to put up the lines. Right. And then regularly we'd be subcontracting over a period five, like we're saying five, ten, I don't know, whatever periods, but um, for an optimum truck. I as well, you know, with all the So they were still okay. Yeah, they have the expertise to do that anyways. They just don't want to look back. They, they don't want to invest in this area. Okay. They want to invest in 5G in cities. That's all they care about right now because that's the only profit center for those businesses. Okay. Um, Go ahead. And that's going to be a problem. It gets deployed in the cities. That, that, somewhere on there you said like digital divide or is that what you called it? When it says digital divide, it means at some point when cities get 5G or crazy fast bandwidth, we're we're gonna still be starting fire with you know Flint and it, it, we won't be able to keep up. So like the the whole work at home model or any of this, all these things we're kind of thinking about just aren't even feasible anymore. So is that because there's um, demand <coughs> on the line? In other words, I I run my business from my house. I'm I have you wouldn't believe what I have in my house as far as technology, and I don't have any, I don't know what you want to call it, hesitation, reservation, you know, in the utilization of the computers that I use. 
So I'm, I never feel like I'm waiting for something to happen on my computer. Um, you know, I've got Optimum yeah. um, with Ethernet. Um, yeah. And I pay, I've got 300. Um, paying business rate for paying business rate. So you're three or four dollars. Yep, over that with everything I've got. Um, so I mean, That's I, a good I, don't, That's a good I don't really. I mean, I I believe that the demand is going to get higher and higher. And so the question is then, is it like driving down the highway in rush hour? Does everything slow down when that demand becomes so great? If you have business service, the answer is no, probably. But. The typical cable line will hook up as many as 100 homes. And those 100 homes are sharing that line. And the, the reason, they, they assume things like 3 to 4% usage. usage. Uh, and that makes, that makes sense. There's a little town in Leverett. This, this is not to say I've anything I've had about, about leaving Leverett or fiber optics. But Leverett turned on a, a complete fiber optic network. It's the same size as Leverett. No cable television. So it was a simple sell. Everybody bought it. All 700 homes. Uh, they turned it on in 1916, in 2016. Everybody got a gigabit in both directions. The average usage total across leverage is 750 megabits total across the 800 homes. Because it's watching television at 7 megabits per second. It's, it's, television is, video is 75% of internet traffic. And it's YouTube at 1.5 megabits, standard television at 1.5 megabits. And HD at 700, at 7 megabits. It's, it's not a strain. It's just not a strain. And they haven't had to re engineer the networks to get close. You probably have some special facilities because you're paying for it. Because you're a big time user. You're, you're not in that 3% range. Um, you still have to get to a node. Uh, but you're going to be, you, you, you would be protected. About poles, though, um, the you, you may remember that the electricity would go out, but our phone would still work. That was because the phones and the old system were powered from the central office. The 48 volt line came down and actually powered the phones. And the phone line is the lowest on the pole. And the power lines would typically break the, the, the branch or the tree. It very seldom would go all the way through all of those, all of those lines. Now, if a pole, if a tree, if a, if a, if a, if a pole comes down, then everybody, everybody gets screwed. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're, we're talking about a layer on the pole that's, that's relatively, and the people, you know, the, 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 uh, the, there's a Litchfield dispatch up in Litchfield that does all 9-11 calls, and sends out fire trucks to police stations. They handle 20 cities. They've got a fire property network all over the place. They have not had one break in the three years that they've been had it. Uh, and they're all on they're all public. That concern is probably not so bad. Now, the engineering of the network would still say, let's make sure that any town, let's say Morris, has two switches in different places. So if one of them stops, everything can be gone, everything can go through the second. And if, if we all get there in the next four or five years, what will happen is that we will build a set of ring, of ring switches. So about every, every eight or ten towns will have a switch in each town, and they will be hooked in a ring, and you can drop the ring at any one, any one place, and they, re they recover. There's four lines hooking them up so that the signals can go in the opposite direction. It's a very, very common procedure in order to give you a very strong backbone of reliability. It's happened all the time. So can we go back here just for a second to, you've been working at this, you're going on two years. This is a kind of, you're, you're looking at this as kind of a, a two year process of trying to prepare the community for right. a vote. Here's the next step. What, what kinds of issues have arisen in the process of trying to get there that um, either questions that have been raised? There are two problems. They're both psychological. One is, I don't need it because I'm happy with what I've got. And Norfolk's exactly the same way. We have 65% of Norfolk's connected with Comcast. I have 300 megabits per second coming into my house. I don't know why, but I have it. Uh, I don't come anywhere close to using it. And I don't pay business, I just, I just have it. Um, and um, the second is I don't pay for it. 
that's the hardest one of the group because we're, you know, we're still living with Mike Carter in our brain. And, and you know, I make a comment, a funny comment in this thing I did for, for Lamont that said, if we took all the things that we should do as a community and burden the community with it, we would be overtaxed. We would not have enough income total to pay for it. You know, think about it. You know, we, did, we did all the schools, all the poverty, all this, all the that. We, we, there's no money. So we have to make decisions, and I think we have to respect that. And this is, in fact, a cost. The community will have to pay something. My claim is it's very little. It's not very much money. One, two, three percent could be milder, uh, if that. And if the state did it, it may be zero under some circumstances. Um, and to me, you know, if, if as soon as we get in our minds that it's as important as roads and, and, and sewer systems and electricity, we get we regulate electricity. We don't tell the labor source, well, you can just look up whoever you want if you don't want to look them up because it's too far away. So I'll tell them, you know, no. They go to the bureau. And charge them the same amount of money. It feels as if it feels as if I, as a just kind of just standard local resident, I might say, well, you know, it sounds like a nice thing in theory, but the truth is, I really don't need it right now. Right? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking at my TV and watching pro football. It's all, it's all good. And you know, and I sort of realized down the line that somehow this might be good for economic development for the community. But that's kind of theoretical. I'll tell you what works. We had focus groups about three years ago. And what came out of them was a sense, I think almost universally, and here most of these people have cable television, that we're kind of sliding down a hill. We're getting older, the school systems are getting smaller, the amount of money we spend per student is going up because of you know, the roads are not as good as they used to be. The amount of salt we put on the roads in the winter. It's, it, we're not dying. I mean, it's just, it, we're, we're kind of going like this. And what brings us back up is young people. Young people. And that became the dominant theme of these groups. That it came out just, if we could get young people back here. If you, if you can stand up and say, We've got a gigabit system. It would be cool. The second thing they thought it was just be cool. You know, it would be really cool to be in Connecticut the first, second, third. We would be in the region the first, do this. And um, there's something to grow about that. There's something to be excited about. So while it's not the big picture of economic development, um, it really is. This will bring young people back here. You know, you could. If you, have a, if you have every home in your community hooked up with the possibility of a gigabit service, you can go to every major business in New York and Boston, to the HR departments, and give them some stuff and say, you got kids who don't want to live in New York and they're working here, and by the way, we can get you at gigabit and we can do a VPN system so that security will get to your home. They'll come. They'll come. How many do we need? A hundred? You know, we're not talking. There are 1.5 million programmers in this country. How many do we need? It's not very many. In your town, can you have a feeling whether the younger people were more open to it or the older people were more, I mean, the younger people who have kids and are paying for college and... I, I, I can say this. Everybody knows it's not that expensive. Um, and we had, we had about eight or nine kids, people move in in the town in the last year who work at home who were in their 20s and 30s. And a woman went around and interviewed them last Christmas. And she asked the question, do I need more? They all said no. Would you like to have fiber optics? It would be so cool, I would kill for it. I mean, this is, this, it's just, it's psychological. It, it's not financial, it's psychological. And it's hard to get over, but you find a way to get over it. You know. Do we have any data at all that would support the argument? Uh, you mean that you actually get economic development? Yeah. No. No. And, um, it's only a component. Yeah. I mean, it, the state of Connecticut needs more than fiber optics yes. to save the state. Yes. And until we get a handle on everything that's driving people away, and, and I have five kids, and only one is now here in Connecticut. 
the other four have moved away. Here's what's happened in other states, because we've, we've now got the oldest municipal based fiber optic network was built in 2005 in Utah. It was a terrible idea. It was almost all of its face. It's basically now basically paying for itself, but it's not even paying back yet. Um, but um, in 2011, Chattanooga, with money from the federal government during the stimulus program, built a network that covered Chattanooga. And it was a big hallelujah. They got a Volkswagen plan. They got a, 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 a Amazon distribution network. It didn't have anything to do with the fiber allergies. And they, they said, well, what's happening? Because the Chattanooga development, the economic development, was worse than the state for population growth for about three or four years. But then this good father said, look, we have to watch what happens in Silicon Valley. And so they took 600 acres of downtown Chattanooga, raised it, and built an innovation center. They now get $50 million a year in venture capital. Their kids with tennis shoes running all over the place. Boston did the same thing in the work. New York did the same thing in Rosa Delano. He and I and others are thinking about doing similar kinds of things that would relate to us, where we can start building programs that would they take benefit of fiber optics in a needed respect that would, that would start to take the things that we have here um, and make them more obviously beneficial to venture companies. And I think we know how to do that. You have to do that for things. The work at home thing is actually easy. You put a team together. We, this is the plan we worked out in Norfolk is that you, you put two teams together. One goes after the big corporations in three cities, you know, Hartford, Boston, and New York. Um, the other starts to, to, that's for people who are working for corporations. And the other is that you start doing what you would do in the real estate business, which is start blanking the place. <coughs> We've got something here for you if you're working, if you're kind of home business. And, you know, it becomes, the beauty becomes, the beauty of massive technology becomes a kind of watchword for the region. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it is a artwork in itself. And we, there's, there's stuff going on to sort of brand the region successfully instead of what we've been doing so far, which is not going to succeed. Mm -hmm. Do you have any It isn't enough. It is not enough. But without it, nothing else. So, so I, I, you know, I don't want to control the discussion, but I, I, so, so, so I won't. <laughs> Do you have any idea today how many people there are in this area that work at home? I don't. I know that. It's a lot. I think it is too, and I think that may be one of those statistics that you might want to go out and it's, pull it's, it's and just see how many there are. I know that CERC doesn't know. CERC doesn't know. I, I know that the Connecticut, Northwest Connecticut uh, Foundation. So one of your, one your best places is going to be the assessor's office. We, we, know, the, the tunnel, the, we know there are 40 homes in Norfolk that have home businesses. That's not going to work again. The town of Washington, I think, did a pretty comprehensive survey. And I think they actually have like very specific across not only that, but age demographics, like lifestyle, weekenders, all that. So I think. Yeah, I, I think in which the lobby uh, may have the information. It's but it's 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 not stuff. It's not demographic information that's easily gotten to because it needs a lot of self-reporting. Uh, you don't know who, and it's kind of community. Yeah. No small towns, that's, that's so, so if you are a remote yeah. worker, there's a protocol, there's a, a virtual, no, a so VPN. VPN. And my experience is that's been really challenging to use a VPN network here on the service I have um, and actually do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's not going to get any better, especially if the VPN is uh, established in the I don't know, an office in New York City or Boston or someplace where they have much faster speeds than we do. So, um, so but, but the bottleneck I see every day. Like it's, but isn't the VPN problem really a configuration problem? I think it could be done some data back and forth next year. So, like, especially for video conferencing. Next year. One of the uh, I, kind of dreams I have. <coughs> 
many in, in a big corporation, like Merrill Lynch or Bank of America, eighty um, percent of the cost of maintaining the IT department is in fixing the people who screw up their computers. And several in the past <coughs> fifteen years, many of these companies have gone through what are called zero client workstations, where you have a terminal, you have a keyboard, all the computing. It's like the old IBM model. All of the computing is done somewhere else. So you can't put a disk in, you can't do your own email. It's only $300 per desk instead of $3,000 per desk. I think a lot of people here choose not to use cloud services because it's not reliable. Yeah. Like it might work in your house and then it's like you can go anywhere else here. You know the, where the, you know the file is there. So, 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 <laughs> so one, of the, one of the things is <laughs> if you can build uh, through a network, a VPN, VPN stands for virtual private network. So it's essentially a dedicated, heavily configured, secure connection between you and a distant location. And if it can be entitled to get behind the firewall or get through the firewall, which requires a lot of security apparatus, so you've got to make sure that it's secure and that you, can, you can do that, then you can really talk these people and say, look, you can have your kids come out here, sit in Morris, and they're doing the same amount of work that they're doing in the office at the same speed. You can't do that with cable television because the upstream speeds and the downstream speeds have to be in the gigabit range because in order to make it work, you have to have very responsive systems. You know, the hit a key, it's got to show up on the screen exactly as it would when it's only 15 feet from the data center. You can do that with fiber optics at a gigabit in each direction. You can't do that with cable. Yeah.